We're going to continue uh, with another section of the Pentecostal Charismatic Movement, which is the or New Order of the Latter Rain. The New Order of the Latter Rain. You know, it sounds like a secret society or something. Uh, but uh, what it is, it's, it's a term for a particular philosophy and doctrine that uh, is common among uh, Charismatics. Now, as I've said before, there are different... Um, there's a whole different spectrum. There's a broad spectrum of Pentecostals and, and Charismatics. Uh, and so the, the New Order of the Latter Reign is just one of those, uh, if you want to say, subsections. And, uh, and, and so we'll get into some different aspects of that. So it all ties in with the Charismatic Pentecostal movement, but uh, this is one specific element of it. Uh, so the first is the Sharon movement, the Sharon movement. Uh, there was a place called the Sharon Orphanage and Schools. It was located in North Battlefield, Saskatchewan. And there was a Pentecostal uh, revival uh, that broke out on February 12, 1948, after a female student had prophesied that a great worldwide revival was about to happen. And so including it, included in this revival were alleged tongues, healings, and prophecies. But you, know, you think about not just this school, but uh, other charismatic places. These places are already saturated in their culture with a seeking for a restoration of end time miracle power. So every once in a while, all of this expectation and all of this uh, wellspring within them gets built up so much that it just bursts and eventually you have one of these revivals or these outpourings. I mean, it's bound to happen and it's, it has happened uh, numerous times uh, throughout history. And uh, so they were already saturated with that in their culture. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's bound to happen. Besides uh, some of the faculty being influenced by William Branham, which he's, you know, he's, his name has come up a bit, uh, Franklin Hall's book, Atomic Power with God Through Fasting and Prayer, was a huge influence. Uh, Hall had a revival center in San Diego and taught that the way to have apostolic miracles restored was to fast and pray. Uh, and just quoting uh, what David Cloud says in his book, uh, he taught a body felt experience whereby through extended fastings, the fire of the Holy Spirit would eliminate sickness, tiredness, and even body odor and would result in immor immortalization. Uh, anybody need help with that? Sickness, tiredness, and body odor eliminated uh, through extended fasting? <laughs> What was the fire of the Holy Spirit like? What'd you, how was that experience? Um, the believer with the body felt salvation would be able to travel instantly to any destination and his clothes would not wear out. And so at the heart of the Sharon movement was a focus on the restoration of apostolic miracles. Uh, they believed that end time apostles and prophets would rise up to lead the movement. Personal directive prophecy was also... A, a part of this, which was ripe for abuse then, if you have these people, and, you know, men or whoever it is, uh, you know, indicating, uh, I have a prophecy for you and, and, and a direct word of the Lord for you that was made it uh, ripe for manipulating people. Uh, the Assemblies of God got upset that they were losing churches and members to the new movement. And they had some disagreements, apparently, with some of the aspects of that movement. Uh, but uh, they, they, they were uh, repudiating uh, that movement. Uh, the, um, and so along with this is the Manifest Sons of God. The Manifest Sons of God. George Warnock was one of the proponents of this, and he had been influenced by Sharon. He attended a camp meeting in 1948 and was hired on staff at Sharon. So features of this doctrine are a restoration of the fivefold ministry in Ephesians 4.11, including apostles and prophets. In their view, the purpose of the church is to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Some believers, the second point is some believers will become manifested as the sons of God and be perfected and immortalized. They would be given spiritual bodies that can teleport, change appearance, speak any language, and perform healings. They would usher in the millennial reign of Christ after fulfilling the Great Commission. Uh, number three, Joel's army will consist of perfected Christians who will conquer and dominate the world just before the return of Christ. And so this is a spiritualization of Joel's prophecies. 
uh, in, uh, in Joel 2. Uh, and that is actually when we talk about, when you hear, if you've heard the term outpouring, uh, that also comes from Joel 2. And, and uh, I've heard that word a lot, outpouring. As a matter of fact, the Asbury Revival, the Asbury itself was calling it outpouring. And so it, it's amazing how many outpourings there are. I mean, <laughs> there are a lot of outpourings. And uh, so let's turn to Joel 2. Let's turn to Joel 2. <clears throat> uh, just find Amos and take a left. <laughs> if you can find Amos, you can find Joel. <laughs> Yeah, then find Obadiah. Look for Obadiah if you can't find Joel or Amos. Okay, Obadiah is right before Jonah. If you find Jonah, you're getting close. You know where Jonah is, right? Uh, Joel, and uh, chapter 2. Now, it's important that we, we look at these uh, prophetic uh, books in the Old Testament. Uh, it's important to look at them in the proper context. And one of the problems with the charismatic movement is they apply so much that was directed to Israel and that has different meanings to themselves and to Christianity today. And if you look at the context of Joel 2, uh, there's, there's a couple of things here that are going on. Uh, one was fulfilled partially uh, on the day of Pentecost. And then the last part of it that pertains to the tribulation period um, has yet to be fulfilled. Uh, turn to Joel 2, blow ye the, uh, verse 1, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Notice this, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. And that is an indication of God's judgment upon the earth, the tribulation period. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a people and a strong, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like uh, mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run upon the wall, they shall climb upon the houses, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble. Notice this, the sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. That sounds familiar to the tribulation period. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. And that's where they get the idea of Joel's army. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And uh, verse 12, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Now this also, because of the time period in, in which um, uh, this, is, uh, was, this prophecy was being made, there's, there's often a combination. There's the initial message to those people right at that time of the nation of Israel, and then there's, and, then, and, and especially here in Joel 2, there's also a forward looking to, the, uh, to something that's farther out in the future. But notice how it says, turn to me with all your heart. And notice verse 13, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering uh, unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth 
of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Uh, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? So even in the immediate addressing of those people at that time, it's directed to the nation of Israel. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. And uh, let's uh, jump down to um, uh, notice uh, verse 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And so there's the the uh, reference to the latter rain. And so the charismatic belief about the latter rain, now the, the latter rain had to do with um, the nation of Israel and God's, whether God was going to bless them or not. Uh, and it had to do with their repentance, if they would get right with him and he would bless them. Because remember, you might remember back in Deuteronomy, uh, if you're familiar with this, that there was, uh, a, there was a blessing or a curse upon the land and Israel's relationship with the land based on their obedience to God. Now, his, his unconditional giving of them of that land, uh, that did not change, but there were conditional blessings in their relationship with the land that if they would, um, would follow him, they'd obey him, uh, then their land would be blessed, their, their people would be blessed, they'd be able to stay in the land peacefully, but then there'd be a curse on the land if they uh, transgressed God's commandments, turned to idols, and disobeyed if they rebelled against him. And so the latter rain, uh, you know what it was talking about? It was talking about rain. And uh, so the charismatics took this and said, oh, this means there's going to be a last day's outpouring, because it talks about pouring out his spirit in the same passage. Uh, last, this means the latter rain, that means right before the return of Christ and his kingdom set up, there's going to be a last day's outpouring of God's spirit, and there's going to be an army raised up, and we're going to take over the world and, and all of this. So that's really at the heart of what their, uh, the latter rain movement is. And the floors, because notice this, verse 24. How do we know it's talking about rain? And the floors shall be full of wheat. That means the wheat's going to be able to grow because they got enough rain. <laughs> and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I'll restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Hmm. I guess the army was made up of locusts, canker worms, caterpillars, and palmer worms. That's Joel's army. Um, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath, hath, hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And notice this, still talking to Israel. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon, call on the name of the Lord, shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So very much talking about the nation of Israel here. Uh, and turn over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Because Paul does, uh, I'm sorry, Peter does uh, uh, quote this uh, prophecy. And on the day of Pentecost, when those uh, people could hear in their own languages the wonderful works of God. And so then Peter stood up and he had something to say. He said, uh, verse um, 15, Acts chapter 2 and verse 15, For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out, my, out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. 
And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so there is the first part of this is what was going on on the day of Pentecost. But at that point, the sun hadn't uh, turned into darkness, moon turning into blood. The day of the Lord had not come, but he's quoting that whole passage. And so there was the, uh, the first part of the fulfillment of that. And then there was, there'll be the remainder when God uh, finishes uh, his dealings with Israel and its, um, uh, the nation's rebellion against him uh, during the tribulation period. And then there will be, as uh, at the end of Joel chapter 2 said, uh, there'll be a remnant. There'll be a remnant that is saved. And so they, but what they're doing is uh, with this, uh, the manifest sons of God, the latter rain, they are Joel's army uh, taking things that are directly pertaining to the nation of Israel and applying it to them. And then it's also then goes back to, should we be seeking a Pentecost every Sunday? They believe in seeking a, a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit every single time. And uh, nowhere in scripture is that, is that uh, necessary? As a matter of fact, what we see uh, that the, the uh, Jews received the Holy Spirit, they had the, 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 first, the gathering there in Jerusalem, they received the Holy Spirit. And then there are a couple other times where in this transition, uh, transitionary period in the book of Acts that you have the Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues. There's other languages. So it was an evidence to the Jews that uh, um, the... Gentiles had also received the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says also in 1 uh, Corinthians that the signs or tongues are a sign of judgment, that there was an indication that the, uh, the, the tongues that the Gentiles had were a sign to the Jews that they as a nation had rejected Christ. And so now uh, there's more being done with the Gentiles, Gentile nations. And so all of these things revolve around the nation of Israel. And so what they do is they take uh, the... Joel's prophecies, and they try to superimpose them on themselves, and um, and believe you know we're, there's this last days. But what does what does the Bible say about the last days? It does not promise before the tribulation period starting of a last days revival. It's a last days falling away. That's what the that's what the New Testament says. It'll be a last days falling away. Uh, Noted in the last days, perilous times shall come, and shall be lovers of their own selves, proud, boasters, blasphemers, uh, disobedient to parents. And so there's, there's the falling away, and then the man of sin uh, will be revealed. Uh, so it's not, a last days falling, it's not a last days revival that then just everything gets so much better and then ushers in the kingdom of Christ uh, because that day of the Lord has to come. will come first before Christ's kingdom is set up. They also spiritualize, uh, their fourth point is that they spiritualize the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, it is believed to describe the establishment of God's kingdom on earth prior to Christ's return. And this is also known as dominion theology, uh, dominionism, uh, that this idea of we need to, Russ and I were talking about Pat Robertson last night. Pat Robertson was a big, as a big dominionist. Um, and uh, so it's the, it's the belief that we need to penetrate all these aspects of society for the purpose of ushering in Christ's kingdom and, uh, and, and, and taking over the culture and all of these things for Christ. Now, at the same, I, I'm all for Christians being a good influence on the culture, but it's, that is part, the, the culture, the world system is not of God. The world system is of the devil and the spirit of Antichrist. So you cannot redeem the entire culture because the culture is at its core in rebellion against God. So what we can do is we can try to be a good influence and try to point people back to God and that they need to repent Jesus Christ, but not just getting into these different areas of society and trying to take it over for Christ. Um, that is not uh, that is not part of the mission for uh, for Christians. Our our great commission is we, we need to preach the gospel. People need to be saved, baptized, and then discipled. That is the great commission. And the more people that that happens to, it will have an effect on the culture. When 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 uh, that is followed, when sound doctrine is being preached and taught, and people are living for the Lord, that in of itself is going to have a profound influence on a culture. And we've seen the opposite of that happening as, 
as people, as people get less and less mindful of God and, and fewer people are saved and fewer people living for God, it's had a bad effect on the culture. But the opposite can be true uh, for good um, when, uh, when, we get, when, as a whole, we get back to that. Um, I mean, it can happen not necessarily across the country. It can happen in a community. It can happen in a community. Uh, if a church has an influence enough on the culture, or enough on people, when you have influence on people, then you're going to have influence on the culture. But it's not a matter of trying to get into different places and take over and, and, uh, and try to take over the country for Christ or take over the world for Christ and, and, um, and, and for the purpose of ushering in God's kingdom. Now, think about what, when we look at what the Bible says, Whose kingdom is next? Well, it's the Antichrist. So if you've got a large group of people that are expecting that Christ's kingdom is next, and they think they need to prepare the world for Christ's kingdom, what are they, what are they unwittingly doing? They're actually preparing the way for Antichrist's kingdom. And especially when they are, everybody's getting unified in religions and like the Catholics and, and um, Charismatics and all these different ones that are just, let's all come together and let's, Let's be one big body and one big happy family. Uh, wow, they're really setting things up quite well. Um, not for Christ's kingdom, but for the last days falling away and then the man of sin to be revealed. The uh, unity, uh, they also believe in the unity of the churches, so no more denominations, under the authority of the apostles and prophets. So that's their fifth point of the manifest sons of God. And... Um, what a, that's a, a, quite a, quite a five-point uh, doctrine. And then there's a man named Paul Kane. He was associated with William Branham in the 1950s and John Wimber of the Vineyard Movement in the 1990s. He said, I want you to know he's coming for the church before he comes for the church. He's going to perfect the church so the church can be the image, be him, and be his representative. If you're really in the vine and you're the branch, then the life from the Son of the living God keeps you from cancer, keeps you from dying, keeps you from death. Not only will they not have diseases, they will also not die. They will have the kind of imperishable bodies that are talked about in the 15th chapter of Corinthians. This army is invincible. If you have intimacy with God, they can't kill you. There will be a manifestation of the sons of God. Now, he supposedly had visions of these sports stadiums just being filled up with people. He had visions of resurrections, believers walking through walls, and preachers levitating. Um, Bill Hammond, what's that? I'd like to see you levitate. I, I, should get a, um, I should get a motorized uh, pedestal in here so that it's, it's completely silent. So then if I talk about levitating and then all of a sudden I just go up and then um, you think it's actually happening. Uh, Bill Hammond, well, he was involved in the Latter Rain movement in the 1950s. He has a ministry called the Christian International Network of Prophetic Ministries. He has said, the earth and all of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, the time when they will come into their maturity and immortalization. When the church receives its full inheritance and redemption, then creation will be redeemed from its cursed condition of decay, change, and death. When the church realizes its full sonship, its bodily redemption will cause a redemption chain reaction throughout all of creation. And he wrote that in the Eternal Church. Uh, he also believes in the denominations coming together to form a renewed church that takes dominion over the economy and other parts of the world systems. And then, uh, last but not least, <coughs> Rick Joyner. Rick Joyner, he might be a little more familiar name to you. I don't know if anybody's heard of, heard of Rick Joyner. Yeah. Uh, Rick Joyner is the head of Morning Star Ministries. Uh, he is an influential figure in the latter rain Manifest Sons of God movement. I found out uh, in, in getting ready for this, he's actually a member of the Knights of Malta. He comes right, right on his website. He says he's a member of the Knights of Malta, which is a Catholic order. Um, I think it's also known as the Order of St. John, but it's, it's, uh, it's Knights, he's a member of the Knights of Malta. Uh, he has a, quite a large network of ministries and churches and is especially influential doing, due to his media ministry. And this guy's been around for years and years. The music, and um, I watched a little bit of what actually goes on at his church. And the music and happenings at his church service are just thoroughly mystical. Thoroughly mystical. Oh, my goodness. There was one particular, I think they have maybe different 
group uh, uh, music there. They had uh, at their they have two different services. One is their nine o'clock one. They, they just were devoting the month of February to uh, just uh, worship and intercession or something like that. And they had one there that very strange. It wasn't your normal like uh, you know, it wasn't like a Christian rock. It was it was more of they were using orchestral uh, instruments, but the type of music it was just sounded very, very mystical uh, and uh, very, yeah, just, just powerful. They're also uh, into the uh, release of energy and God's blessing. So while they're even praying, praying, um, there'll, be, there'll be somebody, there'll be people up there, and of course there's people out in the crowd, they're going like this, and they're just waiting. And, and then literally during the prayer, someone else will be saying, release, Release, release. Now, uh, so my- mysticism and, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, just um, uh, very, very dangerous. He said, "We are all members one of uh, 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 we are all members of one another, and we must start acting like the church as a body." I believe the same thing could be said today that was said before the Revolutionary War, because I tell you, we've come to a time of a spiritual revolution. Uh, that's the truth. Uh, it is a spiritual revolution, but uh, not necessarily in a good way. What Benjamin Franklin said, we've got to join or die is becoming increasingly applicable to the church. Those that refuse to tear down the walls, if the leaders refuse to tear down the walls, I tell you, the people are going to do it. They're going to come down. And just as those of the former order who did not recognize that a new order had come, they got swept away with the changes when they came. If we do not recognize the times in which we live, if we do not recognize the new order has come upon the church, that there is a new order today. There is a revolution taking place in the church today. I tell you, if we do not recognize that, if we do not become a part of that, we are going to be swept away by these changes when they come. Because they are coming, they are irresistible. The kingdom of God is coming, and I'll tell you, there's nothing that we can do to stand against it. And he said this years ago. This is not a recent quote. He also said, I remember some of the most penetrating scenes that I saw in the news last year were the communist leaders who just weeks before, I think this was said in 1990 here, uh, who just weeks before were some of the most powerful men in this world, were on their knees begging the people to listen to them, and the people were saying, away with you, we will not listen to you because you were part of the old order. We will never listen to you again. A new order has come. I tell you, you are going to see the same thing taking place in the church. If you wait until it becomes politically expedient to jump on the bandwagon, I tell you, it will be too late. Today is our day of visitation. Now is the time to stand up for that which is coming. There are changes. The Lord is going to bring down every wall that separates his people. He said that at a Harvest Conference in 1990. Joyner also hates the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine, unsurprisingly. Uh, He also said, I think it might have been the same conference or a similar conference, he said the doctrine of the rapture was a great and effective ruse of the enemy to implant in the church a retreat mentality, but it will not succeed. Already this yoke has been cast off by the majority in the advancing church, and it will soon be cast off by all. That's Rick Joyner. So, what do you do with doctrine like that, people like that? I just do the same thing I always do. I just stand firm, confident in the doctrine of God's word, the sound doctrine of God's word. That's, that's, that's the, it's the weapon of uh, the word of God, the sword of the spirit. But uh, that is the latter rain movement, very dangerous movement. And uh, it's not reflective of all of the charismatic movement uh, by any means. But there are similar, uh, th- th- put it this way, the latter rain movement is taking to a different extreme what is already the roots of which are in the charismatic movement. So in other words, the idea of ushering in God's kingdom uh, is, is fairly common, a very common idea. But they take it to the next level with all of these uh, different ideas of, of the, the signs and wonders that are going to break out in the ar- Joel's army. So that is the end of the latter rain uh, section.